Erica kicked you out, didn't they? My mom. She won't even talk to me. Most of my friends are dead or in jail. If I die in this uniform, I'm a hero. Somebody. Who can be supposed to break you down? Wanna go home? If we leave, they win. Why is this weapon your best friend recruit? Because it's the thing that protects the Marine to my left and to my right, sir. I could have left you at any doorstep. I am never giving up on us. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at The Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live and another in our series on race in America, co-produced with the Capehart podcast. The Inspection is the beautifully written, acted, and directed debut film by, uh, uh, not by, of Elegance Bratton. Not only is Bratton the writer and director, the movie is based on his life, and it's getting him noticed. Variety recently named Bratton one of the 10 directors to watch in 2023. As you see, joining me now is Elegance Bratton. Welcome to, was to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Wow, thank you for having me. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you. I can I can barely speak <laughs> getting through getting through that intro. So, Elegance, I read that you considered writing uh, an autobiography, but you chose to make a film instead. Why this medium to tell your story? Um, you know, it's a it's a cliche, but they say a picture says a thousand words. And I did not feel like I, I would be able to write my life story in a timely enough fashion. So I just cheated with the camera. It had to be the camera. And it's also that I wanted to do something that was like available to people and emotional to people. And I think sometimes books can be a bit intimidating, but a movie, everybody can sit down and watch. So I wanted to make something that was really accessible for, for the culture. Well, in one interview, you said, uh, people don't read books, and <laughs> so that was one of the things. I was trying to be you. nice. I was trying to be nice because it's a newspaper thing. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I read that. I burst out laughing because I'm like, that's true. But there was something that um, uh, that your your husband, or I, as I know you you call Chester, your husband. Um, said is that the thing you do best as an artist, you do best as an artist, is take the audience to a place they can't ever go without you. And your first feature should be intensely personal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My husband was is was and is you know my greatest supporter. I wrote the first draft of this script in 2017, and I was just like you know I just sold my first TV show, My House to Vice Land. I had a little bit of money in my account. And I'm like, I'm never going to have a chance where I don't need to work a normal job for six months. So let me write three scripts. And the inspection was one of them. And, you know, I always got to say thank you to Chester because Chester makes me believe in myself, even when, I, when I'm full of doubt. And this movie would not be around. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Chester encouraging me to keep push, pushing for it. Well, shoot, where's Chester? Because I want to thank Chester for, for <laughs> pushing you to make this movie because it really is just so superb. So the inspection ex explores themes of belonging and identity through your protagonist, Ellis French. Um, we have a clip that captures the super complicated and heart-wrenching relationship uh, Ellis, played by the divine Jeremy Pope, uh, has with his mother, Inez, played by the divine Gabrielle Union. Let's take a look. This little piece of paper. It's all I have left of the dream I held for you. If you don't come back, the son I gave birth to Consider this certificate void. I mean, that, and that's just a piece of an incredible uh, back and forth between mother and son. It's Ellis's first time in the apartment in five years. Uh, she kicked him out. Um, aside from, from, being, from uh, being straight, meaning Inez, the, the character Inez, what are her dreams for her son? 
anything to be safe. Um, I, 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 my name is Elegance. <laughs> Pretty much every room I've ever walked into in my life, people have assumed that I'm black and gay before I ever got there. And that meant that I was a lot of times walking into situations that could be quite dangerous, if not truly physically, but emotionally. And I think a lot of parents out there, especially black moms, want their boys to be safe in a world that seems to be consumed with, you know, their annihilation at times. So, um, yeah, that's what she wants for her son. She wants him to be safe. She wants him. And, and to her, the only way to be safe is to, you know, adhere to the status quo, be a heterosexual, get married, have a job, have some kids. That's where safety lies. Anything else is too dangerous for her to contemplate. You know, not to give away too much in the movie, but that is sort of my, sadly, my my thing. There is a scene toward the mm. end of the movie where um, Ellis and Inez, mother and son, are reunited, and you're thinking, wow, this is going to, like, there, there's a reunion here, and then it just, it just blows up. I, I, I'm wondering, replaying a, a lot of the, a lot of these scenes, can you tell me which, which of these really deeply emotional scenes actually did happen and which are, say, composites of things that happened? Sure. For instance, the scene we just showed, did that act, did that scene really happen in your life? Yes, yes, it did. Um, when it comes down to it, this movie is 100% autobiographical. When it comes to Ellis's, you know, hopes, fears, desires, and motivations, even if it's a situation that I personally haven't been through, but when it comes to the stuff between him and his mom, all of that is from my life. Every one of those words are words that I've heard. Um, I wish I could say I was brave like Ellis, and I, I said some of the things that he says in the movie, but, you know, at the time I was very young and it was all coming at me. But yeah, you know, that birth certificate scene is 100% out of my life. I've, and it wasn't the first time I've gone back to get my birth certificate, mind you, um, mm. but it was the most time that I had to go back and get it. You know, you, you've called Ellis a, a much more heroic version of, of yourself who does things that you would never do. Um, for instance. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and this is so unfair to the people who are watching who haven't seen the movie. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and, I, and again, I don't, spoiler alert, I don't give anything away, but, you know, Ellis, what I can say is that this isn't a movie about someone trying to figure out if they're gay or not, right? When I joined the right. Marine Corps, I came to the Marine Corps after about, you know, a decade out of the closet and living my life. And I honestly felt like my identity was a catastrophe. It resulted in me being homeless for 10 years from the age of 16 to 25. So, you know, um, so, so when it comes down to it, Ellis is a black gay man trying to figure out how to get by in the world and where his place is in the world. It wasn't like I hadn't tried a thousand different things before I joined a Marine Corps to try to become, you know, relevant to the society. But I was just met with a lot of ostracism and rejection at every turn. And, and I, in the Marines, I finally found a team that would accept me. So, you know, one of the things that Ellis does is like it's it's there's a, a scene in it with war paint. And, it, and this is very <laughs> much out of my life, too. Um, but basically, you know, I got to boot camp and war paint. It's like when you see those pictures of Marines and it got like the camouflage on their face. So mm -hmm. Ellis takes the camouflage and gives himself a drag worthy beat and beat beating their face with makeup for those right, who do not makeup, know. Yeah. For the uninitiated. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, um, I would never do that. I would never go to, I wanted to be the wallpaper. I was trying to blend into the background. I didn't, I just was trying to get through so I could go to college one day. So, you know, but the funny thing is, though, when I was, when it was time for me to put my war paint on, I remember my drill instructor remarking, like, man, you put that war paint on fast, and you're doing everybody else's war paint? Where do you learn how to do this? He didn't know I'd pick that up in drag bars as a teenager, but, you know, that's where I got it from. I didn't, and I wasn't brave enough to show them that the way Ellis is. <laughs> I, I love you're doing your war paint and everybody everybody else's war paint. I want to talk more uh, uh, more about Jeremy Pope, um, um, who was recently nominated for a Golden Globe, um, portraying Ellis Ellis French. Um, he said that after reading the screenplay for the first time, 
He said, quote, he wanted to protect you because of how much you put yourself out there. How did you protect yourself emotionally while working on this film? Because I know you've said that you can't even watch the movie before doing a Q&A about the movie. It's so, it's so painful. I'm still figuring out how to protect myself emotionally, to be honest with you, because this is my first fiction film. I'm so grateful to be on a platform like the Washington Post. I have, I subscribe, I read, I love the Washington oh, Post. Thank you. And my, and my, my husband is from PG County, Maryland. So we are, you know, a part of our family. That being said, I've never had a work of art with this level of scrutiny. And it also is a work of art that's about my life. And mm -hmm. I'm, it, every day is a process of understanding how, what is too too much exposure, what do I need to protect? So unfortunately, and fortunately, a lot of that burden falls on my husband, Chester, and my therapist, because I don't have an answer for how to protect myself. All, all I can say is, is that I tried to create, and it comes back to Chester. Chester told me when I got onto set, he's like, listen, you have to be vulnerable. You have to say what you're feeling. Um, you know, my mom, she was killed about three days after the movie was greenlit. And I very much made this movie, you know, I made it for the world, but I very much made it to reach my mom. I, I, I knew that by casting a Gabrielle Union that somebody would go up to her. That, that was her favorite actress. You know, I, I knew that people mm -hmm. would go up to her, look what your son did, watch it, you know, and I was hoping that she would watch it and it would change her. And to have her die so tragically, Man, that that was a lot for me. And Chester was like, "You got to be vulnerable. Like, you can't stuff these emotions down because everyone's gonna know something's wrong. And if you don't tell them where it's coming from, then they're gonna feel, you know, unsafe with you." And once Chester said that to me, I was just like, "You know what? I'm gonna try to do this every day." So every day we got on set, like for instance, you know, there's a lot of violence in this movie, a lot of kind of gay bashing in this movie. Um, not a lot, but it happens. And um, mm -hmm. I remember that got those scenes. In any traumatic scene, I would go to the crew and I'd be like, listen, guys, like I know we don't have enough money. We definitely don't have enough time. But we're all, my crew is very diverse. They're, you know, um, black and queer and they're white and they're female and they're male. And, you know, everybody's gone through some form of trauma that's in the script. And I was like, listen, guys, just tell someone how you're feeling when you're feeling it. Tell me if you need to tell me. But don't just walk around being triggered by this without saying something, even though we're, we have to rush, we still have to take care of each other. So I tried to create an environment of healing on set where when we needed to talk about it, we could talk about it. And in a process that made us such a great unit, such a great family, and it made us, you know, we shot this movie against all the odds, you know, and I'm just really, really grateful. So I, I can't, I wish I could give you a simple answer of how I protect myself. All I could say is I try to remain open and honest with what I feel all the time. I don't shame myself for how I feel. And I'm grateful to be surrounded by people who love me and support me through it all. Yeah, people, um, I think those of us, the movie going public, we sometimes forget what we're watching actors and they're portraying you know, characters, but there are real emotions uh, behind those portrayals. And when it's an autobiographical film, there are real people. Um, who live those lives and um, and have those feelings? And in the case, in your case, you wrote this and you directed it. You were you were there, reliving all of these things. Your movie is all also about, um, which I found interesting. When you take a step back, it's about man about manhood and, and mm -hmm. masculinity. And you said, and I want to quote you, when I joined the Marine Corps, I found a team of men, straight men ostensibly, who couldn't reject me. I received an education in manhood and in masculinity that I had been denied my whole life. And through going through that journey, what did you learn about yourself? I learned that people ask me all the time, like, how are you here now after what you've been through? What is, where do you draw the strength from? And honestly, my sense of strength and power is drawn from forgiveness, my ability to forgive. And that's what I learned about myself in the Marine Corps is that I have a profound um, capacity for forgiveness that, and that that forgiveness is what makes me a real man. And that's what this whole movie is about, is like challenging the notion of what masculinity is. Like Ellis French, just like me, when he joined the Marines, he thought he would be 
the weakest guy because he's gay and effeminate. Um, and then he finds out that every Marine has been given the impossible task of being a real man and being a good Marine and that they're inevitably each one of them is going to fall short. So being, you know, homeless, black and queer, I have learned, you know, a, a, a system I call radical defiant empathy, you know, where if I see where you're weak, I'm going to step in and try to make you strong because I hope that you'll appreciate that and do the same for me. So, you know, I think that's one of the things I learned and I, and I, and I, and I hope that when people watch this movie, that there starts a conversation between left and right about forgiveness as being a tenant of real true masculinity. Like a lot of times when you're a forgiving man, people act as if you're, you know, you, you can't settle your debts. You don't know how to fight. So you have to forgive them. No, forgiveness is actually how you move on and you, and you make the world better around you. So that's what I learned is I learned that I can forgive. Wow. Um, one thing that I had a, a hard time, a hard time doing is um, trying to understand how, and I'll just say it, it the, the character, how Ellis French mm -hmm. is still from the beginning of the movie through the end of the movie, trying to, I don't know, win his mother back, win, win her love, despite yeah. all that rejection. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, and I couldn't help but wonder, given the things Inez says to Ellis, mm. I kept thinking, did she hate him? I know she says, I love you, but I don't like who you are or something like that. But I, I don't know. I'm also a single kid. Um, the single mom also grew up in New Jersey. And yeah. I would have a hard time. <laughs> I'd have a hard time. Uh, forgiving my mom or having a or even wanting to go back to try to win her approval or acceptance after a lot of the things we see Inez do to Ellis in this movie. You know, um, my mother was a really complicated woman. She was the first person to ever love me completely. She was also the first person to ever reject me wholly. Um, my mom was an orphan. She was from the age of 10 years old. She had me at 16. And a part of it in this film is you, you start to realize that people can't give you what they haven't been given. And the unconditional love that Ellis is looking for from his mother, no one had ever given her. So she doesn't know how to provide it to him. And, and, and mind you, like, you know, we were speaking about Jeremy earlier, but as a Black gay man, I don't really see movies with Black gay heroes very often. Most times we're the accessory to the hero, you know, right. the handbag. Um, and the reality of it is, is I think people go to see movies to see themselves and to see aspirational versions of themselves. You know, one out of two black gay men are projected to be HIV positive in their lifetime. We're eight times more likely to be homeless, eight times more likely to commit suicide. You know, there's hell to pay when you're living in this skin and you're trying to be the best, most authentic version of yourself, it, it's not easy. And what I'm hoping to do with this is to inspire a generation to keep fighting. You know, I made this movie for anyone who's ever felt alone, anyone who's ever felt overlooked and abandoned. And I hope that by the end of watching this, you know that you are worthy, that you're valuable, that you're enough, you know? So long story short, me loving my mom makes me feel better about what she did to me. And I can't say that I have all the answers to it, but what I can say is that this film explores those very complicated emotions. What do you think, or what do you hope um, LGBTQIA plus uh, kids, young people, uh, even adults mm. take away from this film? And I would just love to also get your thoughts on where we are as a country right now, where we've got mass shootings at either Pulse or Club Q, we've got laws being put on the books that sort of put targets on the backs of trans people and trans trans kids. Yeah, I, I, you know, in terms of what I want people to learn, like the greatest lesson I learned in the Marine Corps is how to talk to people who are different from me. 
and to find a middle ground, you know, and I, I'm not trying to make the Marine Corps sound like some sort of Pollyanna situation, right? It's it's America. It's a it's a concentrated, intensely concentrated version of the United States. So you've got the racism, the homophobia, the sexism, the classism, the ableism, all of that is still at play. But as a Marine, we're taught that there's no such thing as black Marines or white Marines, right? That we are all dark green or light green. We have an intimate understanding, uh, an, an essential understanding that our lives could quite possibly rest in the hands of someone that is really different and sees the world in a different way from us. And thus, we have to resolve our conflicts before we get to the battlefield. We have to get to that place where we can trust each other to look out for one another. So what do I hope people to take away from this? All 8 billion of us on this planet, all 400 million of us in this country, we are all interconnected. We are all, we all survive because of one another. There is no such thing as us versus them. We are only us. And as a result, we owe it to each other to talk across our differences and to find the middle ground. Like we're in a highly polarized country. You know, the, the, the Senate and the House split right down the middle between red and blue. And people seem to think that these ideologies and this way of seeing the world is going to lead to one side winning over the other. There is no winning unless we all win. And that's what I learned in the Marine Corps. No man left behind. And I hope that that message, you know, regardless of what you think with the military, I hope that message seeps through. In terms of where we are as a country with all these mass shootings, you know, I think queer people, we, we especially queer people of color, we, we exist in the blind spot of a supposedly colorblind society, one that hopes to wish racism away by any means necessary, but is totally intimidated and overwhelmed by the actual work of rooting out structural inequality. Simultaneously, we are living in a world where people are very uncomfortable with queer desire and queer, and, and, and as a result, queer existence. And where does that leave queer people of color? We're in the blind spot. You know, it's, it's, it's not until someone shows up to a bar and starts shooting people that we start to think that maybe, just maybe, we haven't solved our homophobia problem yet as a society. And I think that that's a shame. I think that, you know, we're at a point now where, like, you know, Florida has this don't say gay bill and they're trying to outlaw queer history in, in America's high schools. If you want to stop this, these mass shootings and this horrible violence directed at queer people, then we must create space for queer people to be their full authentic selves and to be accepted. The last 50 years has been about, um, you know, it, it, it's been about tolerance, not acceptance. And tolerance means that I have to shave down what makes me different so you can tolerate me being in the room with you. But guess what? No one has the stamina not to be their full selves all the time. So I'm hoping that, you know, this film is a, a, a nice marker in the road of the next 50 years being less about tolerance and more about acceptance. And acceptance is a bit more of a demanding uh, pull. And so speaking of, of acceptance, then what would you say to someone who has a parent like Inez uh, and maybe they haven't talked to each other in a while, maybe um, the LGBTQ plus person is the one who wants to reestablish a connection, mm -hmm. but it's just not happening. What would you say to them? What I would say is like, you know, Ellis is like, his ability to forgive is only bolstered by his sense of self-preservation. You have to do what is safest for your spirit and your emotional self. I'll tell you a little story. When I was 29 years old, you know, I had gotten restationed. I was stationed in Hawaii as a combat filmmaker and I was restationed to New York City. And my mother called me up and she asked, well, she asked, she demanded that I film my little sister's uh, elementary school graduation because she felt like, you know, if oh, you're a big, bad military filmmaker, why don't you show up and film your sister's graduation? And I went. And none of my sister's friends knew she had an older brother. None of my sister's teachers knew my mother had an elder son. And it was in that moment that I resolved to be a filmmaker, to become a, a famous filmmaker, right? you're not going to ignore me. You will not erase me. You're going to turn on the TV and see my name. You're going to go to the theater and see my name. People are going to ask you if I am yours forever. Um, and within that, I had to make a choice. I could not get where I am right now. I knew that I would never get here 
if I continue to show up to be abused by this person, if I continue to allow her to treat me like a second class citizen, how could I ever trust my instincts as an artist? How could I ever get to the place where I could trust my intuition that I actually had it in me to be successful if I continually go to a place where failure is the only thing that I'm going to get out of it? So I had to make a choice to say, you know what, I'm not, do not talk to me unless you can treat me like a full human being. So what I say to those people who are going through this with their parents, you can love someone from afar. I, I, to me, it was too heartbreaking to give her up and to give up loving her. I couldn't do both those things. So I said, you know what, I'll give up physical contact with you until you know how to do better. But in my heart, I'm going to hold that love for you because in that love, there is hope for myself too. Ellis French doesn't give up on people. That's his greatest strength. And that strength allows him never to give up on yourself. So my advice is you, do not give up on yourself. Protect yourself. Do, and you deserve good things. You deserve love. And if these people that you want, that you love can't love you equally, you can still love them at a distance. I got to get you on two more things in the, <clears throat> we're going to go over time. I'm just telling people right now. Um, <laughs> after, your mo- after your mom died, um, as you say, three days after the inspection was greenlit, you found clippings among your mom's belongings, clippings of, of you, story, stories about you. Um, real quickly, how did that make you feel? It was, um, oh man, I don't want to cry. Um, it was, um, it made me feel really, really uh, happy that she loved me even though she didn't really know how to show it in the way that I needed it, I knew that in her heart, I was still there. Just like she was still in my heart. And that, that made me feel really good. Um, and in, and in um, oh, please never apologize for feeling, feeling the feels as, as the kids say. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Elegance, the, the, I think it was a story in the Associated Press um, where you're sitting, I think you're sitting on a bench uh, in Washington Square Park. And the opening of this, uh, of this profile on you is about you talking about 20 years ago, I was homeless on that bench. I walked down these sidewalks hungry. Uh, I walked hungry down these streets. You know, I did this down, down these streets. You and I are sitting here right now talking about your Golden Globe nominated film. <laughs> How does that make you feel being at this part of an incredible journey? Oh my God, I feel blessed by God. I grew up in a very religious household and I was told that people like me were an abomination and that I could never expect anything good out of life because I wasn't putting anything good in life being myself. Um, So to have a movie that's inspired by the moment, the the lowest moment I was in, where I really truly believe these things. You know, when 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 I was in a homeless shelter, I said a prayer for this, for this moment, to be at a place where I could thrive instead of being in that constant survival loop never having enough to actually thrive, but just enough to get through to the next day. I prayed to God to end this in my life, to end this cycle and to, to show me how to get somewhere better. And I didn't know it at the time, but God had already answered my prayers. God had already said, yes, I was already, by virtue of having that thought, I was doing the work to get here. So to get here now, I feel like I'm just so grateful. I feel so so much joy and so much pride. And I'm so happy that Jeremy is getting the notice that Jeremy's getting and Gabby's getting the notice she's getting because it's like, not only do I get to get here, get to be here, but I get to bring this incredible black woman and this incredible black queer artist along with me. Um, And in, in our community, I get to represent our community to the world and to get here from where I started. I mean, I, all I have to say is, you know, God is good. And, and, you know, people, there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, gay films. Why does every gay Oscar movie have to be about trauma? And I, I don't think those conversations are entirely wrong. But what I will say is 
you know, being black and queer, you have hell to pay to be yourself. There is you it's like Paris is burning. There's the, the military realness guy who talks about how being yep. black the greatest social experiment ever. And I think a part of that is because this whole American dream thing, nobody really imagined it being for us. So every step, you're a pioneer, you know, um, James Baldwin is a pioneer, RuPaul is a pioneer, you know, all of us are pioneering in some way. So the fact that I get to be an example for somebody else, that they can do it too, that they can overcome the adversity that they're guaranteed to face in this skin, I'm just grateful to God. I, I, I'm so happy that I got to the other side of this. I really am. Elegance Bratton. Boy, do you live up to your name. Elegance Bratton, writer and director of The Inspection. Uh, congratulations on the film. Thank you very much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me. This is such a, a real dream come true. And I, I hope we run into each other again on, on the next one. Thank you for having me. Oh, don't worry, I'm finding you. I'm coming to find you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, to check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thank you for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.